keeping kids safe and out of trouble. Tonight on the News 4 Rundown, how local lawmakers are working to crack down on juvenile crime ahead of the summer season. Preventing disasters before they can happen. It's National Work Zone Awareness Week, so we'll show you a new safety campaign hoping to protect road workers and what it means for you next time you're behind the wheel. Plus, I think that it's important for a lot of times us to use our positionality and our privilege to be able to advocate for other people who don't have that opportunity. A local student received a major recognition for his advocacy work defending Latino immigrants facing deportation. How he's planning to use his award to further his mission. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Welcome in and thank you for spending some time with the News 4 Rundown. It's our newscast streaming for you and I'm Tommy McFly. I'm Sean Yancey. It is Tuesday, April 16th and here's a look at some of the top stories we're following. Seven jurors have been seated in former President Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial. Mr. Trump faces 34 felony counts related to an alleged hush money payment to silence adult film star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 presidential election. He pled not guilty. Mr. Trump is required to be present at trial, which could last six to eight weeks. The Supreme Court is considering whether those involved in the January 6th Capitol attack can be charged with seeking to obstruct an official proceeding. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments today on the case. The law in question criminalizes efforts to obstruct, influence, or impede an official proceeding. Convictions can result in a prison sentence of up to 20 years. Today marks 17 years since a student gunman killed 32 people and injured 17 others at Virginia Tech. Governor Glenn Youngkin ordered flags across the state to fly at half staff today in memory of the victims. Virginia Tech began this day with a remembrance with a midnight ceremonial candle lighting. The articles of impeachment against Homeland Secretary and Alejandro Mayorkas are now in the hands of the Senate. Representatives from the House delivered the articles today. The ceremonial action kicks off what's expected to be a very short trial in the upper chamber. All 100 senators will be sworn in as jurors on Wednesday afternoon. As we approach summer, lawmakers in Prince George's County are looking at different ways to crack down on juvenile crime. Today, two bills introduced by the county council, one that would let businesses ask police to create curfew zones and another would increase penalties for ghost gun use. News 4's Marisa Casillas spoke with the council members behind these two bills about how their proposals would work. Councilmember Edward Burroughs' latest bill allowing for the expansion of juvenile curfew zones is not one he's thrilled about having to propose. I was very hesitant to move forward with this, but if things are not getting better, there has to be a remedy. Burroughs says he wants to focus more on providing safe and fun activities for teens, but admits he's received several videos and complaints from businesses about teens causing issues late at night. His latest bill would give businesses a chance to ask for help from police to create these curfew zones. It requires support from two-thirds of property owners in the proposed zone. The curfew would apply to those under the age of 18. It would be midnight on Fridays and Saturdays and 10 p.m. for all other nights. Minors who violate the curfew could face fines that would need to be paid for by parents or guardians. There's no reason to have a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old um, without a chaperone at 2, 3 a.m. Um, on a school night. Ultimately, it would be up to the chief of police to approve the request for curfew. Leaders in the county say it's upsetting to see teens committing crimes or being victims of crimes, particularly gun violence. Councilmember Crystal Orietta introduced a bill that would make it harder for ghost guns to end up in the hands of teens. Her bill adds ghost guns to the list of prohibited weapons in the county, cracks down on sharing of data and technology to 3D print guns, and maximizes penalties for violations. This one piece of legislation won't stop gun violence, right? I, I don't think it will. But what we have to say is that we will make sure that we provide all the tools and resources for our police and our prosecutors to hold people accountable when they are getting weapons in the hand of young people. County Council has yet to vote on the bills. There still needs to be public hearings, but the council members say they hope to have them approved before summer begins. In Prince George's County, Mauricio Casillas, News 4. Mauricio, thank you. For nearly 100 years in Virginia, Central United Methodist stood. It's right across from the Boston Metro Station, but now the church has been transformed into what's known as a faith-based development. 
growing ways to create affordable housing. So finishing up these last minute touches are being done right now on a new facility that offers 144 affordable housing units, an extra preschool for more than 100 kids and a new sanctuary for Central United Methodist. The original stained glass window you can see is actually being repurposed in the project as well. It came through a partnership between the church and the nonprofit Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. Walk through the door, one gentleman told me he just cried. He just cried when he closed the door because it's beautiful. When they get here, they really feel like this, is, this could be a forever home. And that's really exciting why we do the work. The reimagined space did not happen overnight. Central United Methodist first began talking about creating affordable housing in Arlington back in 2007. The first new tenants will move in next week. Well, this is National Work Zone Awareness Week. Today in Baltimore, state leaders recognized the Key Bridge workers who died in the collapse. They also kicked off a safety campaign to urge drivers to slow down in highway work zones. It's been more than a year now since six highway workers were killed along I-695. That's the scene you see there on your left. News Force Darcy Spencer reports that fines will soon double for drivers who speed through work zones. The construction workers who were filling potholes on the Francis Scott Key Bridge when it collapsed were honored for their sacrifice on this work zone awareness week. It's not lost on me that Maryland has experienced two of the worst work zone crashes in our history. As part of the event, a highway worker unity ride with hundreds of construction vehicles was held on 695 in Baltimore. That's where six highway workers died in March of 2023 when a speeding driver crashed into their construction zone. Each incident is unique, but they all remind us of the challenges men and women face every day as they work to improve our highway system. Those highway workers and others who've died since then were also recognized, including Eric Lewis. He was killed in a hit and run during a tree trimming operation on 495 in Montgomery County last December. According to Maryland State Police, 44 people have been killed in thousands of work zone crashes between 2018 and 2022. As we gather here today, we must highlight that many of these crashes, injuries and deaths were not inevitable. They were preventable. Transportation leaders want to raise safety awareness at the start of the summer road project season and remind drivers speeding is about to get more expensive. Governor Westmore recently signed the Maryland Road Worker Protection Act. It substantially increases fines for those who speed through those highway construction zones. Starting June 1st, fines will double from $40 to $80. Next year, there will be a tiered system of fines depending on how much drivers are exceeding the speed limit. Fines can be as high as $1,000 if you're going more than 40 miles per hour over the limit. State Senator Jeff Waldstriker was among the bill's sponsors. He says the speed camera fines are meant to get drivers' attention. Folks need to moderate their behavior and know that when workers are around, when they're in a work zone, it's dangerous for everyone and they should slow down. Once the law kicks in, there will not be a grace period. Fines will kick in right away. The revenue from the tickets will fund highway and pedestrian safety programs. Darcy Spencer, News 4. More than 1,200 crashes were reported in work zones last year in Maryland. And there's new hope tonight of the future of White's Ferry. So over three years ago, owners Chuck and Stacey Kewen They've been working to develop a proposal to gain access to the ferry's landing at Rockland Farm. Negotiations with landowners never really reached a deal. Now, Kewen is offering to donate White's Ferry to Montgomery County in hopes to restart some operations. They released a statement to News 4 saying, Our goal was always to get the ferry reopened. This is not what we originally envisioned, but we recognize the importance of White's Ferry to our region. Sean? There have been two serious fires in the city of Bowie, Maryland over the last few weeks. One left 14 families without a place to live. The other left a 10 year old boy with serious burns to help out. The city is holding a gift card drive. News 4's Megan McGrath says everything donated will go to the fire victims. A chain link fence now surrounds the building, at least what's left of it. Three weeks ago, fire ripped through the Woodland Lake condos. Many families lost everything. 
To help them get back on their feet, the city of Bowie is sponsoring a gift card drive. What's collected will go to residents impacted by the fire, as well as another Bowie family whose child was seriously hurt in a different fire last week. Fires, there's just so many expenses. Even if you have insurance, you just, every single thing that you don't have anymore costs money. And so we're trying to help them out. So we've gotten a variety. Some are food, some are Visa, which is great because you can use that anywhere. Um, but, you know, Target, Amazon, grocery stores, just think. It, you know, they didn't have a toothbrush when they were displaced from their homes. Gift cards can be dropped off at City Hall from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30, now through the 19th and on Monday, April 22nd. Very scary. Uh, you had a friend, of, close friend of mine. Um, she almost lost her dog. Michael Abernathy was working from home the day of the condo fire, and a good friend lost all her possessions. He's donating a gift card to the cause. I think this is a, a very good thing to do for this, uh, for those families that lost everything. Uh, just a way to give them something, just to kind of help out with some of the costs at least. They're asking for physical gift cards, not digital ones, and you can drop them off at City Hall and they'll be handed out to the fire victims who need them. In Bowie, Megan McGrath, News 4. Still to come here on the News 4 Rundown, the season of summer storms will soon be here. Storm Team 4 meteorologist Amelia Draper takes a closer look at how our changing climate can affect future storms. And April is Financial Literacy Month, why financial education is even more important now than ever, and what a trip to Capitol Hill this week could mean for your personal finances. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. Spring has definitely arrived. We can confirm that. It was beautiful this afternoon, but a much different scene across our area yesterday. One second, it was sunny. I was caught in this out in Gainesville. The next, it was hailing and raining, and that was just in Northern Virginia. It was pretty wild to see the change. Mm -hmm. Storm Team 4 meteorologist Amelia Draper explains the complex relationship between our changing climate and severe storms. Severe storms are destructive, even deadly at times, and they're costly as well. Severe storms account for half of all U.S. billion dollar disasters, making this an active area of research to see how our changing climate is playing a role. So here's what we know. For certain weather conditions that help form tornadoes and severe thunderstorms, they're increasing. We also know that severe storms are expanding into historically less active regions and seasons. It's also projected that large hail events will likely increase east of the Mississippi as temperatures continue to warm. And finally, mega disasters are increasing in frequency. This means there's possibly less time and resources to respond, recover, and prepare for future events. And by the way, it's challenging to determine the link between severe storms and climate change because of the complexity of these events. They also happen really fast with inconsistent reporting standards. Back to you. Thanks, Amelia. And you know what April showers also bring, Sean? Yes. Financial literacy. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, April is Financial Literacy <laughs> Awareness Month, but earlier this year, D.C. received a failing grade when it came to teaching our young ones about financial literacy. Yeah, the nation's report card of financial literacy rates states based on money courses and also the ways they teach students how to make money, invest cash, save for retirement, and give charitable donations. Maryland scored a B on its report card. The state requires students to take financial literacy instruction, but does not provide a standalone personal finance course. Now, Virginia leads the class on financial literacy assignment. It earned an A. Students are required to complete standalone money classes to graduate. That F for D.C. did not stand for finance. This week, U.S. House of Representatives co-chairs from the Congressional Financial Literacy and Wealth Creation Caucus, Joyce Beatty and Young Kim, are teaming up for a free event on educational financial education at the Cannon Office Building. They're calling it Banking on the Future Through Financial Education. And earlier today, Congresswoman Anand Beatty and I caught up about it. When we look at some of the data right here in Washington, D.C., with many of our adults, it's not where we would like it to be. So hopefully this will also provide information to young adults, to those who work with financial literacy uh, programs. We're extending an invitation to many local organizations so they can come and get engaged and maybe get tools that will help them take it back to their organization. Those individuals who might be getting their very first job 
and they will know how to save their dollars, how to invest their dollars. They'll also understand words that are so important when people say amortization, when people say how much interest it is paying on the principal. So it's more than just balancing a checkbook. It's making you comfortable with banking and finance. And at the end of the day, hopefully we'll be able to teach people how to invest, how to create wealth. And so what's gonna happen at the event and then after the event? Cause it's kind of like going to the gym. You don't just walk into the gym one day and get all beach ready. It, it, it's a process with financial it literacy is. too. It is definitely a process and it's a two-way process. It's a process for those who are coming to get information, education, awareness, and look at some of the toolkits that will be provided for them. But it's also an opportunity for bipartisan organizations working together to present information to help those who are in need. And I think that's what it's all about. It's encouraging people to get the information. And you're right, it's like going to the gym. You go and you work out and you finish. Well, then you have to figure out how do you bridge that with other things? And that's what we're trying to do. How unique is that to have an event in the Cannon Office Building, so close to the Capitol, that's actively inviting the DC community in? It doesn't seem like that happens that often. I think this is exciting. I think it will put a positive twist on the Congress, a positive twist that we do more than what so often they see on TV and they hear about. We want people to know that we believe in them. And there's so much data out there about the need for more financial literacy. They'll be able to walk through the halls, see members of Congress and take away something that hopefully will make a difference. We'll see you on Thursday at 11, Cannon Office Building, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Thanks Thank for you. making time and joining We're us. We're really today. excited. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Congresswoman. You realize, like, I didn't, we didn't learn that stuff in school. Speak for yourself. Okay. I did. No, well, I'm, there just you go. <laughs> I'm just playing dumb. Product of the Pennsylvania public school system over here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, they do need to do a much better job. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see a difference in the future if they start doing a better job at teaching kids now. Absolutely. And when we come back, wine down in D.C. Our Jumia Labanji takes us inside of a brand new wine shop in the district, how it's incorporating diversity on its shelves and with its staff. And also meet the local student who just received a competitive national award, how he's using it to help others. A brand new wine shop in D.C. is creating a unique experience for everyone. It's called the Urban Grape. That's right. It's dedicated to creating access to the wine industry and diversity on the shelves and within its staff. News 4's Jimmy Olabonji spoke with the founder, T.J. Douglas, about his mission to build community one glass at a time. Let's find something medium bodied. So T.J. Douglas scale. knows his I wine store. You can see on our scale, this is a six. The Urban um, Grape, so like the back of his hand. Here we go. The shop was founded in Boston, but just opened its second location in DC's Shaw neighborhood. The most diverse community down here. Like I feel that this is such a special place as a black man, uh, especially in the wine and hospitality industry. Diversity is important to Douglas. At the Urban Grape, the shelves are stocked with wine from all over the world. Some labels you might have seen before, but most of it comes from smaller vineyards owned by and wines produced by women, people of color, LGBTQ plus and indigenous people. According to the Association of African American Vintners, less than 1% of wineries in the U.S. are black owned and women make up about 14% of U.S. winemakers. And I feel that it is my pleasure uh, to meet people like me that uh, maybe don't have the traditional uh, opportunities that other people may have in the wine industry. And so if I can you know, get their wine out here, whether it's me carrying them in the store or me introducing them to the correct people where their brands may fit, it's just awesome. Another goal of the Urban Grape is to make wine more inviting by taking away any intimidation Douglas created a progressive scale where wine is organized by its body and mouthfeel from light bodied to full bodied on a scale from one to ten. We feel that everyone is a wine drinker and if we can simplify it by putting it on a grid, you're going to have a much better experience. The other part of this business model is giving back and creating opportunities. 
Douglas has used his store to create a pipeline to educate diverse students of wine to all sides of the industry, from winemaking and blending to overall business development. The one-year wine education scholarship with Boston University started in 2020. Now Douglas is hoping to expand it here in D.C. and nationwide. We're increasing the pool of workers uh, coming into this industry, but we're also uh, uh, creating a space where people can see, customers can see themselves represented. And so it opens up a whole new demographic of uh, shoppers that wine was never marketed to them because wine was not for them. So if I can teach someone something so that they actually learn it and not intimidated or have a bunch of information oh, thrown at them, which you start to kind of close down a little bit, I, that, that's my gratification. It, was that a bottle you knew or a friend in the video? There was someone I okay. knew who, who she, she started a, a, a winery here oh, cool. locally in Maryland. So recognizing a number of different faces that were in I that crowd. That. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I was like, hey, Chardonnay, I know her too. <laughs> no, that, not her. Savignon, she's a friend of mine too. The Urban Grape hosts weekly tastings and the shop is located at 9th and N Streets Northwest. This week marks 100 days until the Paris Summer Olympics. So this morning, the symbolic Olympic torch was lit in Greece, where they began, before heading to France. A large crowd packed Olympia to watch the ceremony at the birthplace of the ancient games. Hundreds of torchbearers will now carry the flame around Greece before handing it off to Olympic organizers in Athens. The president of the International Olympic Committee said the games continue to be a symbol of peace and unity for the world. In these difficult times we are living through, with wars and conflicts on the rise, People are fed up. We are longing for something that is unifying us. We are longing for something that gives us hope. The Olympic flame that we are lighting today is the symbol of hope. By the way, the Olympic torch will arrive in France in three weeks. Mm. And ahead of the big game, dozens of athletes are in New York City this week for the Team USA Olympic Summit. Over three days, the athletes will do interviews and press conferences, get that photo shoot done, all counting down to Paris 24. One of those athletes, long jumper Tara Davis Woodhall, came in sixth in Tokyo. She's going for gold in Paris. Tokyo was hard. It was, I didn't get to experience the things that people were talking about about the Olympics. And so for Paris, I'm really excited to just be involved with the Olympics. This year, I'm going hard for it. So we're going to get to the Olympics. We're going to try to win that gold medal and have fun with it. Long jump is so tough, too. Mm. Both Olympic and Paralympic athletes will take part in the summit in New York City. Ah, don't forget, News 4's Jumiel Labanji will be heading to Paris because we are your home of the Olympics. She's going to have live reports with local athletes and the biggest moments from the Games from Paris. It's going to be really fun. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm excited to see how all of our local athletes do. Biggest right. Olympic fan. I'm so excited for all of it. It's going to be great. I'm excited to see you trying all those That's Olympic sports, true. too. I, Tommy got bruises. We'll do that tomorrow here on The Rundown. <laughs> An American University student from Woodbridge just received a very competitive national award known as the Harry S. Truman Scholarship. News 4's Juliana Valencia spoke with him about how he's using this award to further his immigration advocacy and his work to improve lives for low-income Latino families. Edwin Santos believes as long as you put in the work, you can make your dreams happen. I'm a normal kid from Woodbridge that like came from essentially nothing as well um, and that if I'm able to do it then anyone else is able to do it too. Edwin's parents immigrated from El Salvador. The youngest of four, he is the first to graduate from a four-year college and now he's been awarded the very competitive Harry S. Truman Scholarship in main part for his advocacy work defending Latino immigrants, adults, and children facing deportation. I think that it's important for a lot of times us to use our positionality and our privilege to be able to advocate for other people who don't have that opportunity. The scholarship process takes almost a year and you must be nominated by your school to compete. From there, over 800 nationwide applications are reviewed. Then, about 200 students are interviewed, with only 55 to 65 students receiving the award each year. And you've been able to achieve a lot of these goals that your parents aspired and hoped to but weren't able to because of challenges. So what kind of pressure does it have for you when you're 
in the room, maybe possibly the only Latino in the room as doors keep opening for you? Yeah, my dad, my whole life grew up working in construction um, and that's very, you know, labor intensive, very tiring. So just seeing that, of course, motivated me to want to continue. Oftentimes when I want to give up, when things get hard and just also just the social pressure of realizing that a lot of people are facing similar circumstances that my actions can have an impact on a lot of different people. An impact he hopes transcends to improving lives of more Latinos. Edwin plans to use the scholarship money to become an immigration lawyer. At American University, Juliana Valencia, News 4. Congratulations to him. Truly. By the way, three other students in our area also received the Harry S. Truman Scholarship. Jackson Boaz from American University, Ray Epstein from Temple University, and Eli Glickman from UC Berkeley. They're all going to be like the future leaders of our country. Congratulations to all of you guys. Big congrats. And for our area, about 50, we got three? That's pretty good. Way to go, area. Way to go. Great. Yes. We learned a lot today. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. Back tomorrow, we'll do the Tommy Tries and stuff. Uh -oh. So we'll see how all that goes. Thanks Stick for joining around. us. <laughs> Stick around for that one. I'm Sean Yancey. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, join Tommy tomorrow when he tries it. Discus. We'll, be, we'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Good night. <laughs>